This is John, and this is AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. This is a podcast by, for, and about people who have found a secular path to sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. If there is anybody here for the first time, and it looks like we only have one person out there. <laughs> now there's two people out there now. But if there's anyone here for the first time, uh, what we're doing here, this is a live stream that we do every Friday night. And basically, uh, all that's involved is we have a topic. And my co-host, Angela, here, and I will uh, discuss it for about 20 minutes or so. Then we will open up the phones. Uh, this is totally a uh, participatory uh, podcast so that you can participate either by calling in to our toll-free number or by um, commenting in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. But I thought before we get into today's topic, why don't we check in with Angela over there in Boise, Idaho. How are you doing, Angela? I'm doing well. How about you? Not bad. Uh, what's new over there? Has your group started meeting in person yet? I, I bet it not. But <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it has not. Um, and as far as I know, I mean, we're taking it month by month and checking in with the Unitarian Fellowship. Uh, that's where we meet at. And they're um, taking a pretty conservative um, you know, view of when they're going to reopen their building. Um, so we're not really expecting that we'll get in before the first of the new year. But, you know, again, we go month by month and see what's happening. Um, so, no, our group does not. Um, we are still doing the two meetings a week, though, and, and those are going well and uh, still enjoying that. Um, other than, than that, yeah, uh, not too much new and exciting um, over here. I understand that uh, that you had the week off, so you were on vacation. I did, and it's gone by pretty fast, but I still have Monday off too. And I, t- I tell you, I really did need it. But it's amazing how I can stay busy, um, <laughs> you know, even without having to work. I was, I got a lot done though. I um, edited some podcast episodes, and I got caught up on the um, AA Beyond Belief thing, and. Uh, oh, Joe, I think there's some sort of a problem with the Facebook feature on StreamYard. So um, that might be the, the situation where we don't have as many people listening. Ah. Yeah, I, I saw some sort of an error message that StreamYard mentioned that there was some kind of a technical problem with Facebook. But they assured they said that everything's supposed to work, but that you just get this message. Anyway, that there probably is a problem with it, Joe. So, yeah, so I. I, so I had the, I did have the week off and I got caught up on a few things and I'm, I'm just fine. You know, just everything's going fine here. So cool. It, on the bottom of our little stream yard thing next to leave studio, um, it has the, the words having issues, question mark. And I just think that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, yes, yeah, stream yard. I, I am. Can you talk to me about it. We're talking about listening. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I do have some news to report. Ooh, um, okay. Last week, I was I mentioned something about the Higher Palooza three, and I didn't have any information to give you on that. So I put a link out there in the YouTube chat, but uh, for their website. But basically, the, the it's the Cleveland Free Thinkers Group. They're going to be hosting Higher Palooza three on Sunday, September the twentieth. It's at ten o'clock a.m. Eastern, and they're going to have three speakers. Uh, Guy P. from Denver, Colorado, Ali R. from London, England, and Sally P. from Cleveland, Ohio. And you can find more information about uh, Higher Palooza 3 at their website, ftcleveland.com. That's freethinkerscleveland.com, ftcleveland.com. So there's that. Um, and that should be pretty good. I, I did actually attend the first one that they had, and I didn't even realize they had a second one already. So this is their third one. Um, also, um, I'm just going to put this out, out there. We, the secular AA, the secular AA international conference, the secular AA organization, they desperately need a webmaster. And I've reached out to one person. I haven't heard back and I cannot do this. And we desperately need somebody. Uh, so if you have skills in that area, uh, please send an email to secularaa at gmail.com. Even if you can't do it yourself, if you know somebody, or even if you can help out just for a little bit, it would be very helpful uh, because we, we need to get that thing ready. When we had a really clumsy um, exchange of um, webmasters from one to, 
to none. <laughs> and uh, everything that we had prior to um, was, is gone. So we need to rebuild everything from scratch. And it's a ton of work. So def- definitely, if you're interested in helping out, please send an email to secularaa at gmail.com. And what I'll do, um, I answer that email address, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to get someone else to do that. But we're going to, I'm going to forward your email on to the, uh, to Sam, who's the chair of the board and he'll get in touch with you on, and get you going on that. So please consider doing that. Um, and then also we mentioned something about streaming on Saturday. We will be doing that. It's not going to be a weekly thing though. So we'll announce that ahead of time and we'll do that like once a month. So we'll, let's look at doing another one, uh, on Saturday, uh, next month. So we'll be doing that in October, October also, by the way, on October the 4th, this is hard to believe, but that will mark the fifth anniversary for AA Beyond Belief. Unbelievable. Wow. But yeah, it was on October the 4th that we posted our first article. And I thought that it, I thought it was actually in September because I noticed that the first podcast that we posted was in September. And that's true. It did go out in September, but nobody listened to it until October the 4th when it was on the website because <laughs> nobody knew it existed. So anyway, so October the 4th is the, is the day. And uh, Angela and I will do a special episode just to acknowledge that and I don't know. It'd be fun to kind of go over the history of how it all came to be, um, how it's impacted my life personally, and um, give me an opportunity to thank all the people who have helped make it possible. So um, I'm kind of looking forward to that. It's amazing, though, how time goes by. Yeah. Are you going to use lots of the party noises and things? Yeah. Yeah. We'll make it fun. (laughs) Absolutely. Sounds oh, good. how nice for somebody from Facebook. He listens to the podcast on his way, way to work. How cool. That's so nice. Aww. You know, I used to yeah. do the same thing, actually. I, I don't drive to work you anymore. To I did. I listened to our on podcast to on the way to work. Wow. I would. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's actually kind of nice because if I, if I did an hour podcast, I could hear mo- about half of it on the way to work and then I could get the rest of it on the way back from work. And it's like the way back from work used to always take a lot longer. You know, that seems like ancient history when I used to drive back and forth to work. <laughs> oh, man, those days. And uh, yeah, I don't know if, if that's ever going to come back for me for a long time. My, my company seems to be okay with everybody working from home pretty much indefinitely. It seems to be working out for the company. So, Yeah, I know that my, my sister, um, before the pandemic, um, there was just one team for the company she worked for that worked from home and she was on that team um and then the pandemic hit and so she, their team was part of the leadership of training everybody else to be able to work from home and uh and so then i just read i haven't even talked to my sister about it but i read in our local um news that uh that they're not coming back that the company is uh yeah is not coming back to their major building downtown and they're just 70% of their workforce is able to do their work from home. And so they're downsizing the facility that they need. So I think there's going to be a lot of companies doing that. Now, this is totally not recovery related, I guess, but it is kind of, it is kind of interesting. But I bet a lot of companies are going to do that. And we're going to, what are we going to do with all this real estate? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So back to Alcoholics Anonymous and the subject at hand, which is all about listening. What? So, listen. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it for for Josie. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, so today this topic was actually inspired by an article <clears throat> that we posted back in um, oh April of 2017, and it was written by Galen T. Galen does a lot of work for AA Beyond Belief. He's like um, one of our editors. Him and PJ do the editing. Anyway, he wrote this. He's an excellent writer and. In the essay, he writes about the importance of listening to people that we're helping, that we're working with in AA, whether it be someone that you sponsor, whether it be somebody who's new at a meeting, you know, and he wrote in his essay, which I find true for me too, that what he found like when he was sponsoring people is they didn't really um, want him to fix their problem. He, they, they just wanted to be heard and listened to. And in being listened to, they were able to think through and work through their own 
problem. And I think that's what AA meetings do for me, quite frankly. When, I, when I'm when i sharing in an AA meeting, it's not so important for me to get feedback like you would like at group therapy or something. But it's just important for me to get it out and have other people hear me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about it, too, when I read the article was um, – was the sharing in meetings that uh, generally we're supposed to be sharing our experience, strength, and hope, um, but uh, sharing from our experience. And so when somebody does present a topic or a problem or issue that they're having, if it's that kind of a meeting where somebody just presents a topic, um, then, yeah, then we, you know, generally uh, don't launch into what we think they should do about <laughs> that issue, you know, um, so we talk about. So like um, one of the recent ones uh, for our group is uh, why are you in AA? You know, like why, why do you continue to go to meetings and, you know, what's important about it to you? And, um, and so, um, yeah, somebody was, you know, kind of just, questioning that, you know, why do I go and and how important is it to me? And they're somewhat newer in sobriety. And so, um, so we, you know, all shared on, uh, on why we, you know, are members of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, what we get out of it. And if that has had changed, you know, for me, it, it has. Um, but I, I really like that way of sharing because, um, because it does, it can offer hope um, that, uh, you know, particularly if it's a problem like, you know, I, I have to find another place to live immediately. You know, my roommates started drinking, you know, crazily or, you know, things like that, um, which uh, were most of my stories in, <laughs> in early recovery. Um, and uh, people would share about, you know, how they they experienced something similar and got through it and got through it without, um, you know, um, going back out or, or drinking or, you know, causing additional problems and stuff. Um, so, yeah, so I, I really like that. And I, like you said, and I think the article said, um, it seems different than in other therapies. And, um, and that's been brought up in our group too, because, um, we have, uh, members, uh, that are very active in the VA as well. And in the VA, um, substance use disorder treatment. Um, they call each other on stuff, you know, and so we've had to talk about the, the difference <laughs> um, because, you know, that's, that's not really, uh, you know, something that, that we do in our meetings. Um, I mean, maybe they do in other meetings, but particularly in the area that I'm in, in AA, it's, uh, you know, usually a topic discussion and we just share, you know, what our ex experience is with whatever topic um and uh and yeah so that um the listening i think also one thing that i i love about meetings or at least you know the in-person meetings when we had them was that it was like the one time during the day when everybody had their phones off at least right. in in our meeting yep. i mean i know there are some meetings where they're still you know going off with their phones but in our meeting it was pretty obvious that uh that you know phones needed to be down. And so, yeah, so people were actively listening to each other or, you know, thinking about what they're going to say, you know, but still, you know, it gave the impression so that not only, you know, you felt like you were being heard. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I think that that's something that AA has to offer um, that, uh, that other people might not be getting. And yeah, in their it's unique life. to AA. And I think in a way where, you know, cause I've been in group therapy where, you know, you, you, you go around the room and the therapist kind of, um, facilitates a conversation and he wants the, the therapist wanted us to interact with each other. And, you know, so it was a completely different thing than an AA where you just kind of go around, everybody has their say. You know, for two or three minutes, I'm, t I'm telling you like you've never been to an AA meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell me about it. So what happens in an AA meeting? But there's none of that, you know, the, the cross, I know there are, is crosstalk sometimes, but I, and I have been to meetings and I know we've all been, been to meetings like this where somebody does try, like sometimes it'll happen like this, you know, someone will come to the meeting and they will just ask for advice and then they start getting it. And those, I, I kind of cringe at those meetings because it's like, no, 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 no. I really don't want to hear a bunch of people trying to fix this person. And you know, when I was drinking, 
and I think that other people have felt the same thing. You know, I, when I was drinking at the worst of my drinking, I was a younger person. I was always fucked up. I was always having some kind of crazy problem and other people had to sit around and figure out what to, what to do with me, you know, how to fix me. And I, so I would, I hate that, you know? And, and so I think that was one positive thing for me in AA is that nobody was trying to fix me. You know, I was just another person of, of many who have the same problem. And that was huge. Tyler says the, we, the breaking out of isolation was huge. And it was that that's what it was for me too, was that breaking out of isolation, listening to other people, having other people listen to me, you know? So it's just, it is just a huge thing. It's, it's a strength of AA, I think, to have that, that, you know, lack of crosstalk for the most part anyway. Right. Yeah. And in doing the steps, you know, like on, on, uh, I mean, the way that, that I went through them, there's uh, talking and sharing, you know, even up through step five, but for some people, the real sharing um, doesn't happen until step five. Um, But uh, that's one of the things that I think is, you know, new and, and helpful for people newer in recovery is when they, you know, write all this stuff down and then they sit down and they share it with somebody and the person just listens, you know? Um, And then if, you know, if there's some, some stuff that, you know, they think the person might consider differently, um, you know, they, they share that, but in general, it's just, you know, you listen and, uh, and, you know, witness what their experience is and then uh, often normalize it. Like, yeah, you know, I, I remember when I did that, or, you know, something like that. And so this, this huge thing, well, for me, there was a few things in there that seemed very huge, and that I was just cringing at sharing with somebody um, was not not that big of a deal anymore. And so that was very, very freeing. Yeah, and, Joe uh, was mentioning and, just that in his yeah. comment, if you see that. Yeah. Yeah, listening on a deeper deeper level and and stuff so yeah hearing hearing that and then learning to do that as a as a sponsor and uh you know that was one of my sponsor's main things uh to me about sponsoring is she said you just have to see the person for who they are and love them uh until they can love themselves and that's really it (laughs) you know so well i've been on the receiving end of um fifth steps and also on the giving end of course and um and both times, um, I guess I learned from the person who heard my fifth step and he just listened to me, you know, and I think that the only time he would ever talk or share something from his own life would be if I was stuck and he would sense that there was something I didn't really want to talk about or was difficult for me to talk about. And he was really good about uh, making me comfortable so that I could get that out because I did think it was important to get that stuff out. And when I did, And he would ultimately share something with me similar that he had either thought or felt or did. And it, it, you know, it did feel like, oh, wow, you know, I'm, I'm not a freak of nature. You know, this is just a, I'm just a human being like this guy is, you know, and I did the same thing. I just basically listened to the person and only if they were stuck, only if it felt like it was the right thing to do, would I ever say anything at all, you know? Yeah, I, I think, and I don't know if it's just a, um, somewhat of a, a gendered thing, but I know that the majority of the the fifth steps that I've listened to um, have involved um, abuse of some sort that the, that the woman has um, undergone. And so um, always part of that is to, to reflect in a way um, so that they understand that they didn't have a part in that. Um, because I have, you know, I've mentioned it before, and there are people in the recovery um, in this area, and then I've heard, you know, via Zoom too, um, who have had um, sponsors that, you know, told them they had a part, like, you know, one of them did leave um, the rooms because her sponsor uh, told her that, you know, her part in her sexual assault was how she dressed. And it seems like in this day and age that that would not be a thing, but it is a thing. And, um, and so that's why, you know, um, I, I think a little differently, at least the way that I, I do it, is that if there's something in there, then I take, you know, efforts to, you know, let them know that they didn't have a part. And if I haven't already suggested that they get additional 
um, treatment, then uh, we talk about that at that time as well. Yeah, I think that I think you're right that it probably is much more common among women uh, in recovery than men, although I have known men who also were um, abuse survivors. And, you know, that's something to that's something to really think about. I guess there's also you know, time for me too to recognize what I might not be qualified to hear. You know, um, I have not yet had anything like that, but um, yeah. Uh, but that's crazy that so, excuse me, that someone would say that they they had a part in something like that. But I know it happens. I've heard it from other people several times. Right. You know? Yeah. And so I think it's it's something important for us to to talk about, um, or at least to acknowledge that 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 it happens and that you know anybody who listens to our podcast uh, you know that's not something that i would say the majority of uh, responsible people in AA uh, would be doing um and so yeah definitely seek out uh, other people in AA if you've had that experience um or um a therapist okay, to yeah. to talk about that Jackie's comment early on, it felt mind blo- mind blowing uh, to me that people would share things and it was almost like they were in my head or in my gut. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about, Jackie. I've certainly have had um, that experience now uh, over the last few years, I'd say actually the, over the last five years in particular, and I could go back even further, really, since I've been married, I have, I have become more aware of how poor a listener I really am. You know, I can't tell you how often I've had conversations with my wife and she says to me, you're not listening. You, and I was like, what'd you say? What, what'd you, what'd you, say? I, you know, it's like, I, and it's like, she's right. You know, she's, I'm sitting there in the room with her and she's talking and it's like the Charlie Brown cartoon when the teacher's talking or something. I, know nothing, I don't know, nothing's seeping in. And it's like, I'm having a conversation. I'm not picking it up. And then I also noticed that, during podcasts, like if I'm interviewing somebody and I'm, I think I'm listening to them, but then later on when I go back and edit the podcast and I really have to listen closely when I'm doing that editing and I notice that I don't pick up on something like really important that they said, or, you know, or I don't, I don't ask a follow-up question or go deeper into it because I, it just didn't, it didn't seep into me. It didn't, it wasn't, I was probably worried about did I hit the record button or, you know, some other stupid thing like that, but I wasn't focusing on what the person said. So between my wife and the podcast, I really started really becoming more aware that, you know what, this is something I really am not that great at. And I really need to need to get better at. And just having that awareness did help me. And like when I really am focusing on it, then I can see that, okay, this is something that, is truly a skill to be developed. It's not something that you can just assume you, that you do naturally because you're a human. Um, and I actually read a little bit. I did a little bit of research, nothing big, but just Googled a few things. And about um, for the average person and anybody, any human being, they you only remember about 25 to 50% of what's being said to you when you're in a conversation. <laughs> so anyway. So that's just, that's just the way we are. So, it makes sense to me. I, yeah. I would say maybe 10% on mine. But oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. It depends on what it is and, and, you know, the depth of conversation and. That's you know, true. That's true. That kind of, that kind of thing. You know, my mind I think the example it gave up. was like, if you get directions, like if somebody is giving you directions, you only, you're only going to pick up like you know, maybe half of it. And that's kind of true. I mean, if you, if you back in, you don't have to get directions from people anymore, but I don't know, Angela, if you're old enough to remember when you were driving and you had to stop and ask somebody for directions. And it's like, it was crazy because you, Oh fuck. what they say? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> now you just use your phone. It's no big deal. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I I've heard of that. Yes. Was that when you? you oh know, my God, had we had maps. Your, we had maps. Use your use your feet to to <laughs> move the vehicle and stuff. So. We had road maps. We had paper maps. We had to roll them. We had <laughs> anyway. It was those were different days. So what do we really expect? Sponsors are not professionals, inbound and trained by ethical codes. They're gonna bring all their wacky ideas. That's true. You know, that's just the thing. You know, sponsors are just people like us and people in recovery like us. And, you know, we do have to be kind of careful, I guess, about, 
you know, getting the right sponsor. I've been pretty lucky, I suppose. You know, I had some sponsors that were, oh, I mean, I've gotten some bad advice from sponsors and so forth, but for the most part, I've been pretty lucky, I guess. Yeah, I I guess, uh, you know, what I'm thinking from that um, comment or what comes up for me is, is that, um, yeah, expectations are one thing, but just um, the traditions that we pass on, not the literal traditions, but the tradition of sponsoring and things, um, you know, if we want to continue to, to have that as part of of AA is that, you know, it's something that we do need to acknowledge that, well, one, that sponsors aren't professionals, but um, these different difficulties that people have either you know predatory things or you know the not uh not being empathetic to somebody who has been through an abusive situation um that if we talk about those then that does create some uh, some sort of a norm on you know what sponsors do or do not do or what they should or should not you know uh, be doing or saying. And then that not only helps newcomers that if they run into a situation where a sponsor is, is you know, being overbearing or um, stepping in, you know, too much or something like that, then they'll, you know, be able to hopefully feel like they can talk to somebody else uh, about it and get another perspective. Um, but then it also helps people who, as they're, you know, starting to sponsor have a little bit more guidance on you know what uh what they um some i don't know guidance and boundaries <laughs> on what to do because i i don't know about you but my first time sponsoring i was terrified and uh and so it helped me when other people in the rooms talked about sponsoring and um and you know how they handled things and and what they did or didn't do and what you know they felt uh sponsors you know we're supposed to do and not do um so yeah that's my thought on on that is that uh, i think most of us know that they're not professional um but you know th- we're still doing this as part of aa and so setting some sort of um you know standards uh, and and tradition verbally is is one way to do it i also i think we discussed recently the the peer recovery um aspect that is becoming much more uh, prevalent in the U.S. at least, and that at least in the, those situations, those people are somewhat trained in, in um, you know, different things and, and have a better idea of uh, when they need to direct somebody to um, someone with more experience yep. and stuff. Recovery so. coaching, recovery coaches, they go through training and then they, they, before they get certified by the state and every state's different, but before they get certified, they have to do so many hours of actual field work. And so it is something that's kind of regulated and they are, you know, um, they, they do have some sort of a skill set, I guess, that they've been trained um, to do that sort of sort of work. And it's really interesting. It's a, it's a great concept, I think. It's, it puts more people out there, you know, that can actually help people. So that's, yeah, that's yeah, a good I thing. That's great. Yeah. So, and uh, Joe's thing on, on, uh, on uh, directions. Yeah. Um, I, I don't do well with it, you know, and it's funny because my work has to do with GPS, <laughs> but, but in general, you know, I'm much more of a, okay, you go down to the McDonald's and, uh, you know, take a left and then you go past the target and it's, you know, yeah, that kind of a thing, uh, rather than, you know, feet or <laughs> anything else. <laughs> so anyway, Growing uh, back up, to, back to listening. I was, to gro- listening. I'm just remembering, um, and we have pictures of this, but growing up. Okay. So back in the, um, seventies, uh, I lived in Europe as a kid and we, my father was in the military and in the army, you'd get like, you know, a lot of time off work. Like, so like you could take, you could go travel. So it seems like we would take like a summer off work and we'd travel in Europe in a, um, car and we were pulling a little trailer behind us. And more often than not, there's a picture of my dad with a map trying to figure out where the hell we are. <laughs> it's kind of funny, <laughs> but I do kind of, those, those are funny days. And I, I remember my dad often getting lost and then I, and, then, and it was even funnier when my grandmother was around and my grandmother used to give my dad such a hard time for getting lost all the time. But uh, of course that wouldn't happen anymore. So when I was doing my research and it took like not, not a whole lot of time, <laughs> but anyway, when I was Googling on, on listening, so I came up with some different uh, types of listening 
And I'm sure that there are, are more, but active listening, empathetic listening, and what's the other one? Active listening, empathetic listening. Oh my goodness. Oh, mindful listening. And so I, I went to the site is called mindtools.com, which is really kind of a business site, but it had some really good stuff there about listening. And there's a, a difference about between active listening, mindful listening, and empathetic listening. And probably the empathetic listening is what we do the most in AA, where we are actually kind of mir- actually we're the mirror for the person, I guess, is how they describe it. Yeah. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, I I did want to touch on um, the person in the the chat that um, mentioned uh, having a sponsee that uh, committed suicide, and and I'm I'm sorry to hear that. Um, that uh, yeah, definitely is um, is one of the difficulties in AA, or not difficulties, but uh, it's one of the realities um, that we have of when we're trying to, you know, be of service and help somebody, and and it's beyond what we can can do. And I have had. Oh my God! I see the been, comment now from Solar yeah, Team. I'm sorry, I did. I yeah. missed that. Oh my God! Yeah. You know, I did Where have. I, a, I had that experience. I had a sponsee who. Um, I mean, you couldn't have proved it was a suicide, but I was pretty sure it was. He just ran his car at a very high speed into a tree um, for anyway. And uh, I went to his funeral and it was just awful, you know, and I spoke to his family. Because actually I got a call from his, I remember that I got a call from his father telling me what happened. And um, wow. Yeah, it's tough. It is really, 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 really difficult. Anytime suicide just, by itself, anytime you lose someone that you love or know from suicide, I mean, I, I've, I've experienced it firsthand from my mother's death. And I mean, the first thing that I did as a kid, and I think our entire family did that, is you looked back in hindsight and it was like, how could I not have seen, how could I have not seen all the warning signs, you know, because, you know, she was doing all the classical things a person would do before they commit suicide. But we weren't we weren't recognizing that at all, you know. And so I think it's natural that I know I did and the rest of my family took the blame for for her death to a certain extent, felt a lot of guilt over it. So I think and I think that that applies almost any time that, you know, someone who commits suicide. It's like you always say to yourself, I mean, you know, maybe you might say to yourself, oh, God, if I only could have done this or that, you know, and honestly, there's nothing. It's just a, it's just I can I consider it like, you know, an illness. And that's just the ultimate outcome of the illness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it um, I've had sponsees who have been suicidal. And uh, what I generally do is um, is call in my sponsor or another woman who um, who has you know, more experience than I do so that we can, you know, talk together with the person so that they can feel, you know, part of the community um, because there's, you know, more than one of us. Um, and it, it helps, you know, it, it helped me to not feel like I was responsible to keep this person alive. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it did, you know, help that person feel, you um, you know, loved. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that that's, you know, the way to handle everything. Um, but in my case, uh, my experience was that that's, that's what we did. And, and I know during um, this pandemic that, um, that there have been um, quite a few people that have been lost um, to overdose or, you know, suicide and, um, and several women from, you know, uh, one of the groups that I attend who uh, one of them uh, attempted suicide and and um, ended up uh, in the ICU for about a, a week and a half or two weeks, I think, um, on a respirator, but um, was able to to leave. You know, got better and is now working on you know on getting you know some things back together again, uh, so they feel better. Um, but another one, you know, had um, had you know lost her brother. Um, to suicide and, uh, and, you know, family of alcoholics. And so was really feeling that. And, um, and so meeting with her and just talking about my experience with, um, with depression and staying, uh, in recovery and, um, and having that within my family as well, um, 
was uh, was what I could do to help. And, you know, fortunately, that person, too, is now, you know, doing much better and taking, you know, baby steps to to get back into the community. Um, but uh, um, for her, it was uh, mainly um, listening some, but also just, you know, sharing, you know, from my my true experience um, of, you know, what it felt like to me um, and um, and what I did and what I continue to do to work with uh, feelings of depression and um, and family issues and things like that. Um, and then, you know, I think hearing some of that um was you know a type of of sharing that uh, that made her feel seen um, and known in a way that uh, that sometimes you know when we're you know trying to help somebody we're not able to get across so um, so yeah so that was just something that you know did pop up in the chat that I, I wanted to address because um, it's something that we we do go through that I've seen a lot and and you know and I've only you know been sober um, almost 14 years uh, but there have been multiple suicides in my community and it's um and it, it is difficult um particularly when we we do where we are used to sharing our feelings on a certain level you know openly and um and so there is a, a sense of closeness whether it's you know real or not um <laughs> you know we do feel like that and so i i think uh it does um you know uh it feels a little bit personal in in some aspects um of should i do have done something differently or would there have been a different outcome um fortunately i i think you know i've done enough work that i i when these things have happened, I haven't taken it personally. Um, you know, maybe I should have, <laughs> but I didn't. You know, I, I understand uh, that, that, yeah, that I, I can't solve everyone's problems in, in my place in the grand scheme of things. Um, but um, another comment in there that I really like, um, Mary's comment on more books on sponsorship would be great. And, you know, and I think that's true. I mean, I don't know how many are out there. I, I don't generally go to um, the, the local central office um, and, and look at books that often. And so I don't know if there, how many are, are out there. I don't think that there are any uh, secular ones that I know of. And so, you know, maybe that's an area that, uh, that a bunch of us, if you have some time, can can put together a secular guide. You to know, you don't see. I don't know if I've ever seen anything uh, before. And I'm sure that it's that it's happened where there's been like some sort of a seminar on sponsorship that actually kind of helps train people to teach people about sponsorship, how to be a sponsor, and you know what a sponsor should and should not do. But that that would be some important you know, training to have, uh, in AA, uh, so that people knew, you know, the limits of a sponsor and, um, uh, and so people would learn about how to sponsor, but yeah, books would be very helpful. The only thing I know that we have is the sponsorship pamphlet, which is actually, you know, pretty good when you read it. Um, it, and it, it, it does make it clear that a sponsor isn't supposed to give, you know, medical advice and, and professional advice and all that kind of thing. So, um, and it warns against um, the the real authoritative sponsors, which is a problem, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say because I think there are some guides to doing it, but unfortunately, they're usually um, some, yeah, some groups that uh, that are are not uh, necessarily working in people's best interests. Yeah, um, yeah. There's some kind of really controlling type of sponsor sponsorship stuff. But anyway, um, about empathetic listening, I, I, the definition that I found on that website was empathetic listening is a structured listening and questioning technique that allows you to develop and enhance relationships with a stronger understanding of what is being conveyed, both intellectually and emotionally. So as such, it takes listening techniques to a new level. So it says that empathetic listening is a higher level of listening compared to mindful listening or active listening. Which kind of makes sense to me because when you're doing, you know, when you're empathetic, you're putting yourself in that person's place. You know, you're, 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 you're letting that, you're, I guess, feeling that person's pain. Like they used to say, like certain politicians, you say, I feel your pain. You know, you know what I'm saying? Though you're, you're actually kind of putting yourself, I guess, in their place. 
understanding that what they're going through is painful or whatever, confusing or whatever right. the situation might be. Yeah, that was one of the things in the article that I, I you know, don't know that I, I necessarily uh, agreed with of the, you know, saying um, that empathetic listening doesn't come naturally to many of us. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it, it does, <laughs> to, at least, you know, to some of us, you know, maybe I'm an outlier. Um, but uh, yeah, just the, the, and I think that's one of the things that people are missing so much about the in-person meetings is that um, the, the unspoken social cues and the, the way that, you know, you can go to a meeting and, you know, and, and yeah, and have a, a stressful day or, you know, something's on your mind and people say, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm fine. And, uh, but, you know, they can sense that you're not fine. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, we'll either, you know, see if you talk in the meeting or, or get in touch with you after the meeting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, I think is a huge, um, part of at least the the meeting oh man um, you are so right because you know obviously experience. you know we there uh, hum, humans communicate in more ways than just by speaking and writing it's just our body language and the expressions on our face and i remember you know uh, when when i would go to meetings when i was really very new and other times of my sobriety too when i might be feeling some pain and having some difficulties in my life and just having a caring expression of another person sitting across the room and you can see in their eyes that they care, you know, that they're concerned and it just provides a sense of comfort. They don't have to say anything. No words were necessary. And it, that was the kind of thing. I, I know that that's what kept me coming back to a large extent is the vibes I got in the meetings that, you know, people that weren't actually saying anything to me or sharing in the meetings, but they, I could tell they were definitely listening to me and they're listening to me with a real concern and caring. So yeah, that stuff's important. You're so right about that, Angela. And that's why it just blows me away. All the, the new people that are coming into the program now through zoom meetings and what a different experience they're having, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I know that in, in some areas they are still doing um, meetings, um, in-person meetings. Um, um, and um, and then, you know, even within my group, some people get together for like one-on-one -on -one walks, social distance walks, or, you know, a couple of people for a yard visit or things like that. So I think some of the new people are getting a little bit of the the personal, you know, person to person thing, but at a, a smaller scale, um, at least, you know, in our area. But I, I think that would be um, definitely difficult to, to get sober um, just in this, this time period alone because of the craziness, but also, yeah, there isn't that, um, that physical, um, but maybe for some people that that's also a good thing because, you know, if, if you're not, you know, if one of the reasons why you you know, we're staying away from getting sober. One of your excuses is that you're afraid of other people. Um, then, hey, you know, this is probably a good time to get sober because you can, you know, check them out from behind your computer screen before you actually have to be in your in their presence. So, so uh, uh, yeah, a little bit for for everyone. Um, and and I am seeing, you know, the different personalities that are coming in and and the ones that are, you know, this is probably a better way for them. And then the, the ones that it's like, oh, I, I wish that, you know, that there was a way to be able to be, you know, physically present for other people. Like I said, I, there's only one person that um, that I've had uh, within recovery that I've really, you know, met one on one with during this whole thing. And that's, you know, because she was suicidal and uh, and, you know, and so that was important, <laughs> you know, not that everybody else isn't important, but, you know, this was a very um, specific case. Um, and uh, in here, I, like I said, some people are, are going on walks. I know that some of the people that sponsor are, that's how they're getting together with people that they sponsor is going for walks um, so that they're, you know, talking and moving and, um, and getting a little bit of that um, without taking too many risks. So I just Googled Imago therapy from Mary's and it's uh, Imago, Imago. You already know what it is. <laughs> what, what is it? 
<laughs> it, it's well, like Mary says, it's a it's a therapy about listening and repeating what you heard, and you know, saying things so that your partner feels heard. Um, it's basically comes from um, Harville and Helen LaKelly Hendricks, um, and uh, two people who have been in that field for a long time. And the idea behind it is that is that we um, tend to uh, get in partnership and or marry um, a person who has some sort of characteristics that remind us of our attachment, their, you know, injuries or um, whatever growing up and that it's not a um, conscious thing that we do. It's the subliminal cues that we get from the person, which is why, you know, it, I, it makes me think of when you, you're, younger and uh, hanging out with a group of friends and then you're like oh this person would be so great with this person and uh, several of your friends are like yeah those two just seem like they'd be two peas in the pod and then those two meet and they you know have no interest in each other whatsoever and uh, and so learning about imago therapy <laughs> I'm like oh okay so that could be it that's why um, that yeah we uh, subconsciously seek out somebody who um, enacts in some sort of way in your relationship, some of the uh, injuries or attachment um, behaviors that you experienced um, as a child. And so part of Imago therapy is to, to learn to listen and uh, be able to communicate and dialogue so that you, your partner can help you heal those injuries so that it's a, a way to, you know, help help, uh, you know, co-regulate each other. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, seems very successful for a for a lot of people. That's really interesting. It says that the term imago is Latin for image. So that kind of makes sense. And then what else does it say here about empathetic listening? To use empathetic listening, listen patiently to what the other person has to say, even if you do not agree with it. It is important to show acceptance, though not necessarily agreement, by simply nodding or injecting phrases such as I understand or I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I've been, uh, some of the stuff I've been listening to lately has also um, talked about, uh, you know, being intentional in uh, when you are listening, even if it's something that you don't agree with or somebody that you don't like <laughs> for whatever reason. Uh, but always listening to, assuming that there's something in what they're saying that is helpful or um, that you can learn from, or, you know, has benefit. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think that we talk about that sometimes in the rooms as um, listen for the similarities rather than the differences. And so that's how we, you know, we do some of our, our active listening is, um, is by listening for the similarities, you know, what are, what are the things that we have in common? Usually it's, you know, that we, we, felt uh, ashamed or guilty or whatever for our behavior. And we were disappointed in ourselves because we were not living up to our own expectations of ourselves. Things like that are different things that we've done. People we disappointed, you know, all of those things are stuff that most of us, you know, can relate to. Um, not things like, you know, I'm, I'm resentful today because my personal airplane is in the shop. You know, when, when I heard that I was not, uh, I, I, you know, I could not, relate to that. You know, I didn't know how I was going to make rent the next month. You know, maybe I could, you know, hang out in his plane in the shop. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, so the difference is, was he out of plane? I didn't. Um, but we both had resentment. So there was, you know, a way to, to be able to do that. So I think uh, AA has been beneficial, at least to me, and, and I'm sure to other people in helping us to be able to do that. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so the, the stuff that I'm hearing about it now is, is really, you know, um, going into the conversation with that. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's something that, um, that can be a gender thing as well. Um, so, um, oftentimes, um, you know, um, there needs to be active listening there and the assumption that, that what your partner has to say uh, has merit or has something that, you know, um, that you both should be looking at. Um, and oftentimes I think, uh, you know, 
I guess it goes with listening in general that oftentimes when I'm sharing something with my partner, I just want him to hear my experience with whatever the relationship is or whatever's going on. Or like, you know, my, my, you know, girlfriend got upset with me and, and I realized I was being a jerk, <laughs> you know, and, and, I, you know, I don't want him to, to say, well, you need to do this and this and this. And, you know, it's like, no, that's not what I need, you know, and, and, uh, and he's confused because I'm coming to him with this problem. I'm like, no, I'm coming to share, you know, my feelings. And, and so it, it's taken a while for us uh, to work with that. Yeah, and, no, uh, I, I think it is kind of a gender thing. I, I don't, I personally, I could be wrong, but I don't think I have that problem. But I, I, <laughs> for personally, but I, I do know that other guys, they have this, um, and women can have it too, but you just have this natural instinct to want to fix somebody help, you know, if somebody comes with a problem, then you just feel like it's your obligation to somehow make it better, you know? And sometimes, you know, that's not what you need to do. Sometimes you just, you need, and especially in AA, we actually had this, had a problem, um, at one meeting, um, at a group I went to where, um, we had that happen for a little while where there was a certain person that felt like they had to somehow, you know, fix whatever other people had to, you know, fix the people that had to, had something to say. And it just, Oh man, the advice giver, you know, the guy that sits there, like he is the, he knows everything that everybody else should be doing. It was just kind of crazy. Anyway, it can happen. <laughs> right. Anything well, can happen. It can in happen AA. Accidentally too. I mean, and it also depends on just kind of, you know, where we, we are at things. So usually I'm a pretty good, you know, empathetic listener. Um, but you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I wasn't, I had my own stuff that was going on, you know, medical things that were on my mind. And when a friend shared something with me, I, you know, responded in a way that, uh, that made her feel like I was just basically saying she did this thing wrong. And, uh, and, you know, and making an assumption that she had not, you know, researched uh, what the thing that she was doing beforehand. And the truth was, when she said that, I'm like, oh, wait, yeah, I really did. And, you know, so I had to one recognize that the mindset that I was in when when this whole thing happened was that I was in a problem solving mindset, because I had medical and family and all of these things that I needed to be, you know, problem solving, um, because I do need to do that, we have to do that in our lives. Um, and so when, you know, this conversation came up, I, I was not in my, you know, friend mode, I was in problem solving mode. Um, and then acknowledge that, yeah, I really did assume that the that uh, she had not done research, because my assumption was that she would, you know, talk to me about that, because I had a lot of experience in that area. You know, so it was, you know, both I had to look at ego and, you know, acknowledge the assumption, which I did, um, and uh, apologized for. And, um, and so, yeah, so being a grown up is really hard sometimes. <laughs> I guess that's the point of my story is that, that being a grown up is hard sometimes. I, I hate adulting. Um, but, uh, but it's good. It, it's important, um, for me to, to, you know, go through those experiences so that I'm, I'm reminded about them and, uh, and, you know, actually practicing the different things that we talk about on here or that, you know, I try to work with, uh, the girls on things like that is that, yeah, um, I still sometimes I'm not in, in the right mode at the right time. And, uh, and I need to be accountable for that and that it's okay, um, to do that. So, and, you know, one of the bullet points of the empathetic listening that I that I wrote down here is that you get a sense for the feelings that the speaker is expressing, stay mindful of the emotional content, um, as well as just the literal, literal meaning of the words. And we were kind of just already talking about that. But, um, yeah, I mean, oh, boy, and I, I can see this happening at work, too. You know, um, I could sit down with an employee and they are you know, I can tell that they're upset and there's that some work situation that's going on. And maybe I'm not, I might not be happy with their work, you know, as their manager, but clearly there's something else that's more, something else that's really going on underneath all of that. And maybe I shouldn't really care about that as a manager, but um, I have noticed at times, especially now uh, during this time um, that people do have a lot going on, you know, they're taking care of their kids while they're um, trying to work. Um, God, all kinds of different issues are going on. So, 
you know, I'm recognizing that, I guess, more now, um, just in my workplace that um, whenever I talk with my team, I individually, I always have time where we just talk about what's going on in our lives, you know, and that kind of helps get the, um, oh, that way you kind of understand what's going on underneath everything else that we're doing. <laughs> Cause otherwise, you know, if all I do is focus on whatever the work thing is, you know, it's like, well, you know. Yeah. And I could see how that would be beneficial for the team, because if somebody is, you know, um, usually like a, a team player, you know, but really on top of their game and suddenly they're not, then, you know, other people, if they know what's going on, um, are often willing to pick up the slack a little bit, you know, for that person. And so then you feel more like a cohesive team um, rather than just, you know, um, different parts of, of the cog. And uh, yeah. so that's, that's kind of cool. The place I work they're the, they're very empathetic. <laughs> they really, they actually, they actually push it and, and encourage it. And um, you know, it's like uh uh, if, if some of our employees are having a problem, um, with like, uh, when their kids or something that, you know, my boss's boss will even let me know, say, say, Hey, just, you know, if that person needs to take a little bit of time off and don't, don't, they don't even have to charge it to their PTO, just let them just give them some time, you know? And so they're, that's really good, uh, good about that. And so when people just know that, and again, this doesn't seem to have to anything to do with recovery, but it's just nice to work in a supportive place where you know that, you know, people do care and they do listen to you with whatever is, was happening. Of course, we still need to get our work done, but still. <laughs> right. Right. I don't know. I'm coming up with a bunch of stuff that has really nothing to do with recovery. I'm work. I'm thinking about work. Isn't that weird? And I've been off all week. Yeah. I guess I'm ready to go back. <laughs> right. Make sure they're still, still exist without you. They've yeah. made it a week. But you're yeah. right. You know, empathy doesn't, doesn't necessarily come, I guess, naturally. I think, it, you know, I'm like you, I think of myself as being an empathetic person, but I know there are times when I'm not, you know, but um, I think that I do have it within me to be empathetic, but there are some people and I'm not going to mention any names. But they have no, they have no empathy at all, you know, and it's like really weird to witness something like that. And, and it's like, if you don't even have that little spark, I don't, I don't know, man, I, I, what can be done about that? But I think most of us, most people have it within us to, um, because we've experienced, had our own life experiences that we, and we know how painful it was that we can, that we, act, you know, we do care about other people that are going through something like that. We do have that sense of empathy. Yeah. But, well, and, and for people who don't, I mean, I know for a lot of, um, a lot of guys um, in our meetings uh, that they had to shut that part of them off for whatever reason. And so it's not that, that they don't have it within them. They just don't know how to do it. And so, yeah, I do think that it, it can be something that can be learned. And, uh, you know, I often advocate for the book, Nonviolent Communication, uh, Language of Life. Um, so um, because that has, a you know, some some guides, some uh, dialogue, things that you can use so you can get used to phrasing uh, things in a certain way to make it um, make it more open um, for dialogue rather than, you know, this is, you know, how I feel. I feel this, this, this and this, you know, and, uh, you know, and it comes out you know, <laughs> somewhat harsh. Um, so, yeah, so there are things, you know, the Mago therapy has uh, stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of different uh, ways you can learn it. Um, but, uh, but it, yeah, it, I think it can be learned in that, you know, sometimes it's that, um, you know, the culture that you're in that wasn't allowed or it wasn't safe. And uh, so to learn, you know, um, to start building some trust and, um, and the ability to do that. And um, yeah, I, I think that that can happen. Uh, because yeah, with some people, they just weren't taught, um, or weren't in an environment where they needed to um, use empathy um, to, you know, and then there's some of us who had to rely heavily on being able to feel the situation around us to, to, you know, know how to act in order to survive. So, um, there's, there's some balancing that needs to happen in recovery regarding, you know, listening, empathetic listening and boundaries and all of that fun stuff. Aaron's comment is a pretty good place to end up. I think he says, I'd never, t I'd never tell a newcomer to put a plug in the jug or take the cotton out of my ears and put it in my mouth. 
I've had that experience as a newcomer and felt very alienated. I needed to talk. Boy, is that not the truth? And because like we said at the beginning of this podcast, that is what I found the most helpful for me personally was talking and being heard, you know? Yeah. And our meetings, we usually really, uh, at least, you know, in person, um, we've done it online too, but um, that was something we talked about in business meetings before actually <laughs> was, uh, was that, you know, to encourage, you know, people who are new to share, you know, um, you know, not forcing them, but um, that it was something that our group really wanted to make sure we were doing was encouraging them to share. Um, what I found is that in, in some um people who have been in AA for a while, um, that if that's the way that they, you know, uh, were initially brought in, um, that they still talk in those terms, you know, um, not necessarily that they think that other people should do that, but they they say that part of their story is that they really did need to shut up and just listen or whatever. And, um, and so that's been interesting to me to to, you know, start picking on, up on that. And I've only uh, been hearing that lately as I've uh, been communicating or been in meetings with people from all a, a, around the world, um, that that's, you know, something that some people, um, and the, the person I'm thinking of right now um, is a, a woman. And so it's something that she internalized from the type of AA that she uh, got sober in, that that was, you know, part of her story. And, um, and so, yeah, so I know that our group actively tries to avoid that um, and let people know that, that we really want to hear what they have to say um, because it, it helps us <laughs> in our recovery. So it really does. They, that's, I, I totally agree with that. That's the most important. They always say the most important person in the room. I don't know about that, but yeah, maybe. yeah. I think uh, yeah some people person. argue about that, but I, I do think it, it's important because it is. Uh, you know, for me, it, it reminds me or, or it lets me know that nothing's really changed out there in the world of alcoholism <laughs> that, that, you know, um, yeah, if I, I choose to, to drink again, that, yeah, there's not going to be anything different. And it, uh, I think it helps for those people to know that they're um, contributing, you know, that they have, um, you know, it's the service that, that they're giving. Um, so it gives them a sense of purpose in their sobriety, not only just for them to get sober but that you know that they're able to be helpful to us as well yeah well we've come up on an hour thank you angela this has been a great conversation and thank you everybody for participating in facebook and youtube it looks like the facebook comments did come through so uh, apparently that was working i'm glad and uh this turned out to be a really nice uh, episode i enjoyed it a lot i learned a lot and i'm glad that um i'm glad that we did this topic so We'll be back again next Friday for another uh, live stream, and I look forward to it. And Angela, you have a nice rest of the weekend. Don't tell me what to do. But I won't yeah, tell you what I'll, to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, I'm sorry. You can't boss me. I hope you have uh, a nice weekend. Yeah, yeah. I usually say, have a great day if you feel like it. <laughs> and yeah, the rest of you, so. the same. Take care, everyone. <laughs> Bye-bye.